from downtown San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering IBM Chief Data Officer Strategy Summit 2018, brought to you by IBM. Welcome back to San Francisco, everybody. We're at the Park 55 in Union Square, and this is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage, and we're covering exclusive coverage of the IBM CDO Strategy Summit. IBM has these things, they bookend on both coasts, one in San Francisco, one in Boston, uh, spring and fall, great event, intimate event, 130, 150 chief data officers, learning, transferring knowledge, sharing ideas. Karen Woodruff is here, she's the principal data scientist at IBM, and she's joined by Ritesh Aurora, who's the director of digital analytics at HCL Technologies. Folks, welcome to theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. You're welcome. So we're going to talk about data management, we're going to talk about data engineering, we're going to talk about digital, as I said, Ritesh, because digital is in your title, it's a hot topic today, but but uh, Karen, let's start off with you, principal data scientist. So you, you're the one that is in short supply. So a lot of demand, not, not enough supply. You're getting pulled in a lot of different directions, but talk about your role and how you manage all those uh, sure. demands in your time. Well, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of our work is driven by business needs. So it's really understanding what is critical to the business, what's going to support our business's strategy, and you know, picking the projects that we work on based on those items. Um, so it's, you really do have to cultivate the things that you spend your time on and make sure you're spending your time on the things that matter. And as Ritesh and I were talking about earlier, you know, a lot of that means building good relationships with the people who manage the systems and the people who manage the data so that you can get access to what you need to get the critical insights that the business needs. So, Ritesh, data management, I mean, it just means a lot of things to a lot of people. It's evolved over the years. Help us frame what data management is in this day and age. Sure, so there are two aspects of data in my opinion. One is the data management, another one is the data engineering, right? And over the period as the data has grown significantly, whether it's unstructured data, whether it's structured data, or the transactional data, we need to have some kind of governance and the policies to secure data, to make data as an asset for a company so that business can rely on your data, what you are delivering to them. Now, the another part comes that the data engineering. Data engineering is more about an IT function which is data acquisition, data preparation, and delivering the data to the end user, right? It can be business, it can be third party, but it all comes under the governance, under the policies which are designed to secure the data, how the data should be accessed to different parts of the company or the external parties. And how do those two worlds come together? The, the, the business piece and the IT piece, is that where you, you come in? Um. It, that, that is where data science definitely comes into the picture. So um, if you go online, you can find Venn diagrams that describe data science as a combination of computer science, math and statistics, and business acumen. And so where it comes in the middle is data science. Um, so it's really being able to, to put those things together. But uh, you know, what's What's so critical is, um, you know, Interpol actually uh, shared at the beginning here, and I think a few years ago here, um, talked about the five pillars to uh, building a data strategy, and you know, one of those things is use cases, like getting out, picking a, a need, solving it, and then going from there, and along the way you realize what systems are critical, um, what data you need, who the business users are, you know, what would it take to scale that? So these like proof point projects that you know, eventually turn into these bigger things, and for them to turn into bigger things, you've got to have that partnership, you've got to know where your trusted data is, you've got to know that how it got there, who can touch it, um, how frequently it, it's, uh, it, is updated, um, just being able to really understand that and work with uh, partners that manage the infrastructure so that you can leverage it and make it available to other people and transparent. I remember when I first interviewed Hillary Mason way back when and I was asking her about that Venn diagram and she threw in another one, which was data hacking. Uh-huh. Right, so you got, yeah. Well, you talk about that. You got to be curious about data. You got to yes. like taking a bath in data, right? <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, I mean, yeah, you really, it's, sometimes you have to be a detective and you have to really um, want to know more. And uh, I mean, understanding the data is like the majority of the battle. So Ritesh, <laughs> we were talking off camera about how titles change, things evolve, data, digital. They're kind of interchangeable these days. I mean, we always say that the difference between a business and a digital business is how they use data. Um, right. And so, 
digital being part of your, your role. Everybody's trying to get digital transformation right. As, a, That's great. as an SI, you guys are at the heart of it. Uh, certainly IBM as well. What kinds of questions are, are clients asking you about digital? So ultimately see data, whatever we drive from data, it is used by the business, right? So we are trying to always solve a business mm -hmm. problem which either optimize the issues a company is facing or try to generate more revenues, right? Now, the digital as well as the data has been married together, right? Earlier, there are, you can say we were trying to analyze the data to get more insights, what is happening in the company, and then we came up with a predictive modeling that based on the data that we historically collect, how can we predict the different scenarios, right? Not digital. We, over the period of the last 10, 20 years, as the data has grown, there are different sources of data has come in picture. We are talking about social media and so on, right? And nobody is looking for just reports out of the Excel, right? It is more about how you are presenting the data to the senior management, mm -hmm. to the entire world, and how easily they can understand it. That's where the digital from the data digitization as well as the application digitization comes in picture. So the tools are developed over the period to have a better visualization, better understanding. How can we integrate annotation within the data? So these are all different aspects of digitization on the data, and we try to integrate the digital concepts within our data and analytics, right? So I used to be more, uh, I mean, uh, I, grew up, I grew up as a data engineer, analytics engineer. But now I'm looking more beyond just the data or the data preparation. It's more about presenting the data to the end user mm -hmm. and the business, how it is easy for them to understand it. Okay, I got to ask you, so you, you guys are data wonks. I am, I am too kind of, but I'm not as skilled as you are, but, and I say that with all due respect, I mean, you love data. Yes. Right? Um, as data science becomes a more critical skill mm -hmm. within organizations. We always talk about uh, the amount of data, data growth, mm -hmm. and the stats are mind boggling, but as a data scientist, do you feel like you have access to the right data and how much of a challenge is that with, yeah. with clients? So, so we do have access to the data, but the challenge is company has so many systems, right? It's not just one or two applications. There are companies who have 50 or 60 or even hundreds of applications mm -hmm. built over the last 20 years. And there are some applications which are basically duplicate, which replicates the data. Now the challenge is to integrate the data from different systems because they maintain different metadata. They have the quality of data is a concern. Uh, and sometimes there are international companies, the rules for example might be in US or India or China the data acquisition rules are different, right? And do you are, as you become more global, you try to integrate the data beyond boundaries, which becomes a more compliance issue sometimes also mm -hmm. beyond the technical issues of data integration. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think you know one of the other issues too you have is um, you've heard of shadow IT, where people have like servers squirreled away under their desks. There's there's shadow data where people have spreadsheets and databases that you know they're they're storing on like a small server or that they share within their department. And so you know you were discussing we were talking earlier about the different systems, and you might have. Um, a name in one system that's one way and a name in another system that's slightly different and then a third system where it's it's different and there's extra granularity to it or some extra twist and so you really have to work with all of the people that that own these processes and, and figure out what's the trusted source, what can we all agree on? So there's a lot of, it's funny, a lot of the data um, problems are people problems. So it's getting people to talk and getting people to agree on, well, this is why I need it this way and this is why I need it this way and figuring out how you come to a common solution so you can even create those um, single trusted sources that then everybody can go to and everybody knows that they're working with the, the right thing and the same thing that they all agree on. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the politics of it, and I mean, politics is kind of a pejorative word, but yeah. the, just say dissonance, mm -hmm. uh, where you have maybe you have a back end system, uh, financial system, mm -hmm. and the CFO, he or she is looking at the data saying, oh, right. this, this is what the data says. And yep. then, I mean, I was talking to a, a recently a, a chef in mm -hmm. a restaurant said that that the, the CFO saw this, but I know that's right. not the case. Yeah. I don't have the data right. to, to prove it, so I'm going to go get the data. Yep. And, 
And so, and then as they collect that data, they bring together. So I, I guess in some ways, you guys are um, mediators. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Because the data That's doesn't correct. lie, it's just, you know, you just got to understand you, it. You have to ask yeah. the right question. <laughs> yes. And, well, and, yeah. And sometimes when you see the data, you start to, you don't even know what questions you want to ask mm -hmm. until you see the data. Is that a, is that a challenge for you? Yes, your all, right. all the time, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. okay, um, what else do we want to we want to talk about? Uh, the state of, of, of collaboration, let's say, between the data scientist, mm -hmm. the, the data engineer, the quality engineer, maybe even the application developer. Somebody, John Furrier often says, my, my co-host and business partner, Data is the new development kit. Mm -hmm. uh, give me the data, and I'll you know write some code and create right. an application. Or so. How about collaboration amongst those those roles? Is that something? I know IBM's announced some products there, mm -hmm. but to your point, Karen, it's a lot of times it's the people. It is. And the the, the culture. What are you seeing in terms of evolution and maturity of that challenge? It, you know, um, I have a very good friend who likes to say that data science is a team sport. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these should not be like solo projects where you're just, one person is wading up to their elbows in data. This should be something where you've got engineers and scientists and business people coming together to really work through it as a team because everybody brings really different strengths to the table and it takes a lot of smart brains to figure out some of these really complicated right. things. I, I completely agree. Because see, the challenge is we always are trying to solve a business problem. Mm -hmm. It's important to marry IT as well as the business, right? We have the technical expert, but we don't know, we don't have domain experts, subject matter experts right. who knows the business in IT, right? So it's very, very important to collaborate closely with the business, right? And data scientist uh, intermediate layer between the IT as well as business, I will say, right? right. Because a data scientist, as they, uh, over the year, as they try to analyze the information, they understand business better, right? And they need to collaborate with IT to either improve the quality, right? That kind of challenges they are facing, mm -hmm. and I need to, uh, the, the data engineer has to work very hard to make sure the data delivered to the data scientist or the business is accurate as much as possible. Because wrong data will lead to wrong predictions, right? Yeah. And ultimately we need to make sure that we integrate the, uh, the data in the right way. Much different cultural dynamic than it was, say, 10 years ago where you'd, you'd go to a statistician, you know, <coughs> she'd fire up the SPSS, we give me the use frequencies, that. <laughs> run some, I'm sure you still do, but run some chi-squares and give me some you know, probabilities and you know, maybe run some Monte Carlo yeah. simulation, but one right. person kind of. Yeah doing all that, is right. your point, Karen. Well, and, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, there are it, there are some students I mentor at a local university, and you know, we, we've been talking about the projects that they get, and that, you know, more often than not, they get a nice, clean data set to go practice learning their <laughs> modeling on, you know, and they don't have to get in there and clean it all up and normalize the fields and look for some crazy skew or null values or, you know, where you've just got so much noise that needs to be reduced into something more manageable and so it's, it, you know, you made the point earlier about understanding the data. It's just, it really is important to be very curious and ask those tough questions and understand what you're dealing with yeah. before you really start jumping in and building right. a bunch of models. Let me add another point. The, the way we have changed over the last 10 years, uh, especially from the technical point of view, 10 years back, nobody talks about the real, time data analysis, mm -hmm. because there was no streaming application as such. Now, nobody talks about the batch analysis, right? Everybody wants data on real-time basis. Mm -hmm. Or not, if not real-time, might be near real-time basis. That has become a challenge. And it's not just the transactional which are happening in their ERP environment or on the cloud. They want the real-time integration with the social media for the marketing and the sales and how they can immediately do the campaign. Mm -hmm. Right? So, um, for example, if I go to Google and I search for for any product, right? For example, um, a pressure cooker, right? And I go to Facebook, immediately I see the ad. Yeah. Within two minutes. Yeah, the retargeting. Right? <laughs> so that's a real-time analytics is happening under different application, including the third-party data which is coming from social media. So that has become a good source of 
data, but it has become a challenge for the data engineers yeah. and data scientists. Yeah. How yeah. quickly we can turn around well, it's all the data better, analysis. Because it, it used to be, you would get ads for a pressure cooker for months, even after you bought the pressure cooker. Yeah. And now it's only a few days, right? It's, it's, it's a minute, it's a minute. <laughs> you close this application, you log into Facebook, oh, no doubt. Yeah. and ad is there. There it is, yeah. yeah. So there because is. everything is linked, either your phone number or through your email ID. You're done. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> I mean, uh, talk about, we talk about disruption a lot. I wonder yes. if that whole model is going to get disrupted in, in a new yes. way, because so, everybody's sort of using the same so, ad so, so that's a big change over the last uh, 10 years. Do you think, oh, go ahead. Please. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, another thing is just there's so much that is available to everybody now. You know, it's not, there's not this small little set of tools that's restricted to people that are in these very specific jobs, but with open source and with so many software as a service products that are out there, anybody can go out and get an account and just start, you know, practicing or playing or joining a Kaggle competition or, you know, right. start getting their hands on, there's data sets that are out there that you can just download to practice and learn on and use. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, the, it's much more open, I think, than it used to be. Yeah, community editions of mm -hmm. software, open yep. data, yep. and the, the, the number of open data sources just keeps growing. Do you think that machine intelligence can, can or how will machine intelligence help with this data quality challenge? I think that it's it's always going to require people. <laughs> you know, there's there's always going to be a need for people to train the machines on, on how to interpret the data, how to classify it, how to tag it. Um, there's actually a really good article in Popular Science this month about a woman who um, was training a machine on fake news. And you know, it, it did a really nice job of finding some of the, the same claims that she did, but she found a few more. Um, so, it, you know, I think it's, on one hand, we have machines that we can augment with data and they can help us make better decisions or, or sift through large volumes of data, but then when we're teaching the machines to classify the data or to, to help us with metadata classification, for example, or to, you know, to help us um, clean it, I think that it's going to be a while before we get to the point where that's the inverse. Right, so in that example you gave, the, the human actually did a better job mm -hmm. than the machine. Now this is amazing to me how what what machines couldn't do that humans could, you know, last year and now right. all of a sudden, you know, they can. It wasn't long ago that robots couldn't climb stairs. You know? And now yeah. they can. It's, now they can. it's, just <laughs> it's a, really it's creepy. Nice <laughs> I think the difference now is earlier you know you knew that there is an issue in the data but you don't know that how much data is corrupt or wrong, mm -hmm. right? Now there are tools available and they're very sophisticated tools. They can pinpoint and provide you the percentage of accuracy, right? right. On different categories of data that, that you come across, right? Even, uh, forget about uh, 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 the structured data. Even when you talk about the unstructured data, the data which comes from social media or the comments and the remarks, that you log or the log by the customer service representative, there are very sophisticated text analytic tools available which can talk very accurately about the data as well as the personality of the person who is uh, who's giving that information. Tough problems, but it seems like we're making making progress. So all you do is look at fraud detection as, as an example. Mm -hmm. Folks, thanks very much for Thank coming you. and sharing your insight. You're very welcome. Thanks. All right, keep it right there, buddy. We're live from the IBM CDO conference in San Francisco. We'll be right back. You're watching theCUBE.